I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to Impact Cyber Church, where you're going to church with the whole world. That's right. People all over the world are going to church with you right now. You know, back in the old days, uh, people came into the wilderness in America, and, uh, you know, they didn't have church three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, uh, Wednesday night, you know, Monday night visitation, all that kind of stuff. They had a, they had a circuit preacher that would show up maybe once a month, and they would have a church service once a month. You know, one of our problems with trying to be believers and trying to know how to be and participate in the church is the minute you say church, everybody's mind goes to a preconceived idea that is based on our modern Western culture. And, uh, and the truth is, uh, there is no one single biblical pattern for church. Church is it works the way it works for you in the community of believers that you choose to associate with. And so, you know, I hope you're getting fellowship. As a matter of fact, I hope that a lot of you are in impact groups and you're doing this with groups of people so you can worship together, so you can visit, so you can get to know each other because we need fellowship. We need connection. Or maybe you are in a great church and I'm thankful that you are and you're using this to supplement your life. But I want to tell you something. We have this because people all over the world for years and years and years just said, we need to be able to make this journey based on this new covenant message uh, of faith righteousness. And we want to make this journey and we want to do it consistently, but we just can't find places that teach this. And so this is why we have Impact Cyber Churches, so people all over the world can keep making this particular journey. As you know, we're talking about being the wisdom of God. And the reason we talk, we call this being the wisdom of God is because our tendency in Western thinking is to think about wisdom as something that we just do. But what you're going to learn through this series is that wisdom is more about identity because it's a whole life thing. Wisdom, wisdom comes from many components. And at the end of the day, the ultimate component is your heart. And when you start getting into your heart, it gets into how you see yourself, who you believe yourself to be. It gets into your identity. So a person is never really going to have godly wisdom apart from shaping their identity. And I'll tell you, this is an incredible series and it's an incredible uh, message. So let's just, let's just start at the very best place, and that is the starting place. You see, when people are facing challenges in life, when people face a crisis, or really when people get saved, or when people want to expand their lives, uh, that needs to happen around some kind of a plan. Now, I'm not talking about a plan where you try to lead God and tell Him how you want this to happen. I'm talking about a plan that is open, that is flexible, that gives you the opportunity for God to work in your life, for God to lead you. But still, you have to have a basic plan. The way the heart and the mind works, the way God created us, is if we have a target or a destination in mind, then our heart and our mind will work together to take us to that particular destination. But if we don't have a destination in mind, then the real truth is uh, uh, we're, we're just kind of in limbo. You know, some of you have heard me talk about this before from the book of uh, uh, Deuteronomy. I think it's like about the 30 or 31st chapter. Or there's the famous quote in there that says, choose this day, you know, choose life, choose death, choose blessing, choose cursing. Now, <clears throat> nobody thinks that they choose cursing. But you have to realize something. Because planet Earth and, and this environment is functioning under the curse that man brought. God did not bring the curse. Man, who has authority over planet Earth, brought the curse. God said, because, told Adam, because of this, because of you, the Earth is cursed. He didn't say, I'm cursing the Earth because of you. He said, because of you, it is cursed because you had dominion here and you didn't want me, God was more or less implying, you did not want me to be Lord over the earth. And so you are now Lord over there. So it will go the way you choose. Well, the thing about a curse is a curse is when we get something, we want it, but it's something destructive. The curse is 
is not God coming along saying, I'm going to make this happen to you. The curse is when we want something and it's destructive. God warns us against it and we get it anyhow. We pursue it anyhow. And it's just like drinking. If you were to decide you were going to drink Clorox, if you, you, know, you think you just got to have some Clorox to drink and you drink it and you get sick and you may die. Your organs may fail. You may go through all kinds of misery. You may leave your, your family penniless because your insurance won't pay since, it was, since they would have considered it suicide. Side, but you got what you wanted. God did not make all of those things happen. So you have to understand the earth is, is, is I call it entropy, and I'm not sure entropy is exactly the right word, but you know, you know, entropy is, is, is chaos, and, and it's the destructive process of chaos. The earth is in a natural, and this environment is a natural state of entropy. It's falling apart. There, there are chaotic factors that are leading planet earth to an ultimate uh, uh, ultimate consequence and so if i don't choose life if i don't if i don't choose to step over into this supernatural realm if you will into this god realm into this realm that called the kingdom of god if i don't choose to step over into that then by default i have chosen to let my life follow the course of natural events and if it follows the course of natural events it will always follow the way of the curse. You know, when I choose not to trust and follow God, I have chosen the curse. And uh, a lot of people may be sitting there quoting the scripture that Jesus has delivered me from the curse of the law. I'm not talking about the curse of the law. This, has, this is not the curse of the law. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things that happen in planet earth that are not the curse of the law. So, but once I choose life, and again, I'm not trying to direct God. I'm not trying to tell God how that life needs to come to me. I am open to God. I'm going to follow his plan. And so once I choose life, now I know what it is that I want. You know, if you're in a situation where you're, where you're facing financial disaster, what's interesting is you may, you may choose something that solves the symptoms but it doesn't solve the problem. In other words, you may choose to believe for or to look for a way to earn or somehow or another to come up with the money to get you out of trouble. Well, that's great. That eliminates the symptoms, but that does not eliminate the problem that got you into financial trouble. And so uh, when, when we pursue the miracle, the miraculous, if you will, when we pursue the miraculous, we're generally pursuing something uh, that, that only alleviates the particular symptom. If, for example, uh, you know, I remember a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Betty Baxter, who we used to have minister here, and oh man, she was a blessing. She has one of the most powerful healing testimonies of, of the 20th century. And Betty actually traveled with and worked with most of the great healing ministers uh, back in the day, you know, of... of um, uh, of the big tent revivals and when Oral Roberts ministry was just taking off and Jack Coe and all of these different people. And there was one particular uh, healing evangelist that called her one time and said, the, Betty, the Lord has spoken to me and told me if I don't change my ways, it's going to cost me my life. Now, what ways, he, and, and she asked him, what, what, what are you talking about specifically? She, he said, well, number one, and the guy was tremendously overweight. Number one, I, I'm a glutton. I just, I, I just am out of control in my eating. He said, but then the second thing is I live in constant stress and strife because of the way I get people to come to my meetings is to go in. And he, he would actually go in and challenge the Church of Christ to debates. And he'd run ads in the newspaper about debating the Church of Christ. And back in those days, you know, there was, man, the Church of Christ in the South was a lot more aggressive back then. And boy, they were ready to debate. And he never would have a debate. He would just use it to get the crowds there and get everybody worked up. And he said, if I don't deal with this, with, with this gluttony problem, if I don't deal with this strife problem, it's going to cost me my life. Now, when he died, most people thought that God killed him for, for not obeying him. But the real truth was, no, he got, he got what he wanted. He kept functioning in, in those things. Now, even if he had gotten a miracle and, and had a healing from whatever damage this stress and this weight issue was causing him, if he did not stop living in strife and if he didn't stop uh, uh, overindulging in himself, he would reach that problem once again, he would once more 
come to that place. Now, we don't want to be fools who spurn the wisdom of God. And, you know, the Bible talks about if you rescue a foolish person, you'll have to do it again. You just have to do it over and over and over again. And so most of us have this, you know, we have this idea, whatever it is that we want, the, the plan that we have is to solve the symptoms, is to get rid of the symptoms. But I got news for you, and this comes from, this comes from over 40 years of ministry, about 45 years of counseling, personal ministry, of talking to thousands of people one-on-one. -on -one. And I got news for you. I, I could probably count on both of my hands over all that period of time when somebody would sit down with me facing some kind of a crisis or a challenge that they actually wanted to deal with, uh, with their life, with their lifestyle, the, with, with, the th with the core of the problem, with what was getting them into these symptoms. Everybody wants to come in, get you, they want you to get them out of pain, and the truth is you're, you're not going to see them again. So we've got to have a plan. And so, so in this plan, like I say, in every situation, we've got to have a plan of some type. And it doesn't have to be a great elaborate plan. As a matter of fact, if it's too detailed and too elaborate in the beginning, it's usually us trying to control God. But when we're faced with problems or crises or really we're just, we're just uh, uh, wanting to expand our life, we are either planning or we're indecisive. Now the problem is, and this is how we get indecisive, is we think we need all the details, we think we need all the answers before we can put a plan together, so we freeze up, we get stuck in indecision. And of course, like I say, failure to have a plan leaves us to suffer at the power of entropy, the natural decay of chaos and disorder. And, um, but once we get a plan, and it doesn't have to be a complex plan. Like I say, the simpler the better. You really just got to answer two questions to get the, the initial part of your plan. Number one, what is it you're looking for? What is it that you want to have happen? What is the end result that you really seek? Now, do I want to get out of this pain or do I want to become the person who never gets into this pain? Do I, do I, and so you can have both, but if you, if you choose the symptom, if you choose your plan is just to get rid of the symptom, then you will still have the disease and you will find yourself facing the symptoms over and over and over again. And eventually you'll get discouraged. You'll think your faith isn't working. You'll think God's not working and, and you'll get frustrated and you'll give up or, or at least live in discouragement and depression. So, you know, I like to pick a plan that's, that's a lifestyle plan. It, you know, when I, whenever I was faced with financial problems, uh, when Brenda and I first got married, man, I was plagued with financial problems. You know, I'd been sick already for uh, a, a few years when she and I got married. I had out of control medical expenses, had out of control legal expenses. I couldn't work uh, uh, very often. It, it, was, it was hard to get up and go to work every single day. I was having to buy medication to stay alive. I'm telling you, we were, we were struggling financially. But I didn't want to just meet those financial needs. I wanted to become the kind of person that could live the abundant life. I wanted to be a prosperous, general, generous person, not just somebody that had their bills caught up. So for me personally, I'll, I always make goals that are about lifestyle, which means I'm probably going to change. I'm probably going to have to grow up. I'm probably going to have to, I'm probably going to have to repent. I'm going to have to give up some things that I'm dependent on that aren't working. And I'm going to have to open myself up to some new things. And so then the next question is, how do you think you're going to get this end result? Wh what do you need to reach this goal? So, most of us have a general concept that we'll reach this goal and through some general approach, we'll read the Word of God or we'll pray real hard or, or something like this. Well, you know, first, we know that, you know, that all things are ultimately resolved by faith in the heart based on the finished work of Jesus. We understand that. We know we've got to learn to take our problems to the cross. We know that when faith comes alive in our heart, wisdom is then going to manifest and going to show us how to walk that faith out. Now, <clears throat> I want you to understand something. When the Bible talks about faith without works is dead, 
Uh, I don't think most people get that. As a matter of fact, you know, a lot of this generation just rejects the book of James because they don't understand those types of verses. You know, faith, living faith, it, it, it is alive. It, it keeps you moving. It keeps you active. It keeps you going in a direction. It's not just some, it's not just some static state of being. And faith always produces something. Well, I want to tell you one of the things that true faith is always going to produce. True faith is always going to produce wisdom because wisdom is the practical application of truth. And we'll get into a whole lot of the aspects about wisdom that, that I, I'm sure you may have never, ever thought of. And we're going to get into aspects of identity that I'm telling you that are going to open your world up to an entirely new dimension. But see, many times... We, you know, we think that faith is, I'm saying this is what I want, and I'm saying this is how it has to happen. You know, I have known people that have spent their entire life going from healing meeting to healing meeting to healing meeting to healing meeting because they are convinced, and sometimes to the same person, if the person has a reputation for miracles or healings happening, they'll go to that same person's meetings over and over and over and over again because in their mind they're convinced that this is what how it needs to happen. If this person would just call me down to the front, lay hands on me, give me a prophecy or something, then, then I would get healed. So really that's, that's not what faith is about because faith is about trusting God and following God, being open and listening to God. So, so the, the real truth is when, when you have faith in your heart where you actually trust God and you're open to God, very probably God is going to provide you with some direction. And that direction is going to show you how to walk out the process uh, to get that end result. You know, I've, I've shared this so many times, but I, I think it bears sharing again. Uh, most of you know I was born with a congenital kidney disease. And so all of my life I was plagued with one sickness after another, pretty much all related to my kidneys. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I began, you know, had happen more than once would be, I'd be in a situation where literally it would just come alive in my heart and I would know that I could get up and walk out of the hospital right then and, and, I'd, and I'd be all right. And, and, and I did it. I did, that, I did that more than once. I mean, I literally... There were times when I became so convinced in my heart that I would have the doctors come in and, and pull tubes out of me and, and unhook IVs and, and um, uh, remove catheters, and literally I would just get up and walk out healed. That happened, that happened more than once. But, but, you know, the tendency is if we experience something one way, one time, and it works really well, we want to do it that way every time. Now... <clears throat> Faith is a matter of the heart. And, and, and I've said this to a lot of people, uh, and, and sometimes people just don't understand it. But see, see the, battle, the battle of faith is, and, and the wavering between faith is, being, is your soul being dominated by your circumstances or by uh, the Word of God. And you waver between the, here's the promise. Man, you, you're reading the promise. As long as you're keeping your attention on the promise, man, it's like you're sure, you're immovable. But then all of a sudden the pain gets worse and you start putting your focus on the pain or the nausea or whatever. And suddenly, man, you start wavering. You're wavering between, between truth and between circumstances. And so, you know, I've told people this. I said, you know, when I fought this battle for my life, I was, I was young. Uh, first time in my life I ever believed that anybody loved me. When, you know, when, you know, I, now let me say this. I, I knew my mother loved me. And you know, I came later to know that other people did love me. But as far as me being able to experience it at that time in my life, I couldn't. And Brenda was the first person in my life that I actually trusted her, her love for me. So, you know, here I am, first time in my life, I, I, I'm really deeply in love. You know, before, I'm not saying I didn't ever love anybody, but I'm just saying, uh, well, it doesn't matter what I'm saying. I'm just telling you, I trusted her love. And so before, you know, I, I, I never had that. I never had that kind of motivation in my life that made me want to stand up and fight the way I fought through this, through this sickness. And so, so it was all the things that I was excited about life. It was easy for me to stay focused and motivated on the word, the promise of God. And, um, 
uh, and, and I do want to say, in that situation, God showed me how to walk out of that disease. And it was a process. God showed me how, how my heart had become corrupted because after a lifetime of having a disease, being treated for a disease, listening to people talk about my disease, and every time something came up, every time something went wrong in my health, it was about that disease. You know, when your whole life's been dominated by something like that, it, it, it's hard to see yourself. It becomes part of your identity. It becomes part of who you are. And you don't even know how to experience life any other way without this being here. And so, so God showed me how to, how to persuade my heart to believe the truth about who I was in Jesus and what was mine in Jesus. And it was quite a process and it required an incredible amount of diligence. Now, the Bible says labor to enter into rest. See, We've got these, these quick fix formulas that we think, you know, okay, I'm going to confess it real hard. The minute I believe, uh, you know, or, or I'm going to confess it real hard, then bam, it's over. As long as I've confessed it and gone through my faith formula, then, then this is all mine. Well, but it said labor to enter into rest. Now, the labor is not you getting God to do something for you. The labor is to persuade your heart of what God has done for you. And once you become fully persuaded, that's when you enter into rest and suddenly it's over. The struggle is over. So the struggle is not to get a miracle. The struggle is not to get God to do something. The struggle is to believe that in your heart and to, and to persuade your heart. And so, you know, I, I walked out of that disease and it was, it was about a three and a half year struggle. And, uh, I, you know, I came out of that disease. What's interesting is, you know, when I have health problems now, and I do from time to time, people always assume that it's my kidneys. Well, you know, I just had, I just had a medical test done just a, a couple of weeks ago. My kidneys function better today than they did when, when I was in my 20s. And uh, so the issues that I have today are age-related, and uh, I was in an automobile accident and, and related to, some, you know, to some of those things that happened as a result of that automobile accident. It's, so it's not my kidneys that I, that I, that I struggle with anymore. But you know that there were times, and, I, and I've told this story before, and I, I hate to repeat myself too much, but I remember one time, I, 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 man, I started not feeling good. And you know, my first impulse is never to call the doctor. My first impulse is to do some of the natural stuff that I know to do and, and treat myself. And usually that gets me out of the woods quick, quicker than a, most doctors could get me out of the woods. But you know, it was, it was one of those times where it was like, I just, I was getting ready to get into get her done mode and in my heart, I heard the voice of the Lord. I, I told Brenda, I said, call my doctor. And she almost fainted because I never say call the doctor. And so, you know, we go to the doctor and we find out that, that I was actually uh, really in a, in a situation where I, had, where I had become so toxic that uh, I, I thought I would have died. If, if I'd have gone to sleep, if I'd, have, uh, if I'd have done surgery on me, if anything had happened, I would have died because there wouldn't have been enough oxygen it left in my body because there was, there was uh, uh, so much infection that, that I, couldn't, I couldn't pull out of it. Uh, <clears throat> you know something? Me living and me dying was not because in advance I came up with the complete plan I knew and I chose the end that I wanted and I let God lead me through the process because my process, and I believe I've accepted this as God's process, God's ultimate solution for every situation is who I am, how I live my life, not just what I do. I don't want to just solve a bunch of symptoms. So let, let, me, just, let me just read this scripture for you uh, in the, uh, the, book of, the book of James real quick like because I'm almost out of time. James 1, 2 says, Brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials. Now, don't take that and say you want to get in trials and tests, and that's not what it's talking about. But it says, the, it says knowing this, that the testing or the proving or the uh, bringing forth of your faith produces patience. See, patience is the ability to stand under pressure without wavering. When you are in faith, you will always be able to stand under pressure without wavering because faith is sure. It doesn't waver. It says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect. In other words, reach the goal. That word perfect means to, to reach the goal, not 
be flawless, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. You notice it didn't say when you are facing these situations to ask God for a miracle. It said to ask God for wisdom. Because wisdom is God's plan about how to walk into the truth that you believe in your heart. You know, I, I, just, I just want to touch on this just a minute. Because the, the Hebrew word for wisdom, and remember in the Hebrew words, you go to the root, or when you go to Hebrew words, you go to the root word, and not only do you have the meaning of the word, but you have the meaning of each of the letters. And so the Hebrew letters for wisdom, the first one being the chet or the ch, the chet, is man becoming one with God. So is, does your solution start with becoming one, syncing up, getting in harmony with God, who He is and, who he, and, and what His promises are? The second letter is the cap, which is a cup. And what, what's interesting, uh, uh, it, it, when we approach God, it, our cup has to be empty. We have to empty the cup. And that's what the cap reminds us of. I have to empty this cup if I want God to fill this cup with His plan. If I'm becoming one with God, He's not becoming one with me. I'm becoming one with Him, which means I need, I need what He's got to say. I need His plan. And then the last letter is what we call the closed mem. And the mem represents water. And, and the thing about water is you can look at it from the surface, but you can't really tell what's going on really, really deep unless you dive into the waters. Well, when you dive into the waters, you go in deep and you see what other people can't see. The closed mem represents God's secret knowledge for you. Now, I'm not talking about knowledge that it, it, that is not in the Bible. I'm not talking about knowledge that supersedes the Bible. I'm not talking about a special revelation of God that nobody else has. I'm talking about the, the secret knowledge of how truth can apply in your situation, how you can walk this out. This is where you connect with God intimately and personally and hear His voice and allow Him to lead you into a, a process that can't fail. Listen, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be continuing this series on being the wisdom of God. You know, if you're interested in getting this series in its entirety, then check it out at impactministries.com. This is an incredible series. And I've got hours and hours and hours of teaching on this that we can't get all into this broadcast, but I'm going to get you as much as I possibly can in this broadcast because I'm telling you, this is truth that will revolutionize your life. This, see, miracles bring a cure for a problem that's already been created. Wisdom prevents the problem. Now, wisdom will get you out of the problem, <clears throat> but when you're walking in wisdom as a way of life, it will keep you from ever getting the problem. So do you want to spend the rest of your life having to get the faith up to get out of a problem, or do you want to use your faith to avoid the problem? I'll be talking to you again next week. Be sure and like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'll be talking to you again soon.